Good morning, everybody. Jim Feist and Joe Mack. Joe, you're in New York. I hear the weather's nice, but tomorrow, not so much. That's true. We've got, obviously, great baseball action. It returns to the Bronx tonight. Astros-Yankees in the American League Championship Series. Series tied one game apiece. Tonight is a, today, and then into tonight is going to be a beautiful autumn day in New York, but tomorrow, not so much. All the reports, and the word I kept hearing yesterday was it's going to be an all-day soaker on Wednesday. So, we're going to see what that does to the pitching. We're going to see what that does in terms of momentum within a series. That's always important. We know we got fans out there who can remember this been World Series and stuff where you've got, or postseason series, where you've had a rain out which has helped uh, a team pitch a different guy or be able to skip a guy. So we're going to keep our eyes on the weather reports for tomorrow. As you said, Jim, it sounds like it's going to be pretty bad all along the East Coast. Same for Washington, D.C. If the Nats don't uh, put the brooms to the Cardinals tonight, then uh, we'll, we'd have a game five in D.C. tomorrow, and the reports there is almost certain right now. So we're keeping an eye on the weather, but right now we got a beautiful day, and we expect it to be a beautiful night for Astros, Yankees, and certainly the joint will be jumping over there in the Bronx. Well, I'm sure it will. It'll be a big game. You've got the red-hot pitcher with Cole going today. And last night we wa- we watched the football game with Detroit, Green Bay, and um, turned out to be a one-point game. Green Bay hitting the, the, the final uh, field goal to go up by one, win the game. A lot of controversy in that game with a lot of bad calls, or at least a lot of people feel those calls were bad. I agree. Um, I, ha- I hate it. It's, it's becoming a joke, actually, in a lot of these games. I don't know if the officiating crews, some of them are just absolutely terrible. I don't know what they can do about it, uh, but they need to do something about it. No, I'm with you. Uh, I just finished writing the column for uh, Jim Hurley Network, and uh, we've got a daily column that goes up that, that I actually have called Jim Says. It's on our website, jimhurley.com. And, uh, you know, I touched on it. I mean, a paragraph or so on the game last night, and it is. It, it's disappointing. I mean, forget who has action on what side. Because let's face it, everything got affected by the calls, especially late in that game last night, the size, the totals, the money line, all that stuff. Uh, what's so upsetting is they've got all this replays in, and I, I, don't, I never was one to like the replay, but if you're going to use it, you use it. And, I mean, you get these calls with these hands-to-the-face penalties, and you're showing it to a nation of people, and you've got a former referee, John Parry, in the booth, and I'm telling you, he must have said, I'm going to say five out of six penalties that were called in the second half that were questionable or controversial. I would say John Parry, who was a very good ref in his day, said, you know what, they missed it. Or, you know what, it wasn't hands to the face. Or, you know what, he did, the 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 quarterback did interfere with the wide receiver. I mean, you can't be having this. I mean, incompetence is one thing, but you just, I mean, even, even after the game, I stayed on and was watching Scott Van Pelt on ESPN, and they showed the replay of that one rushing touchdown by the Lions, where one linesman comes running in and he's got his arms up signaling touchdown. The other guy is signaling a closed fist for fourth down and pointing where he got stopped. And Scott Van Pelt said that kind of epitomized the night. The the, the officials were almost never on the same page. Times that guy threw a flag at the conference, and it's bad. It's bad. I mean, I know you and I talked before the start of this broadcast that you know, you're going to wind up having fans and, and people who have their money on these games saying this fixed or whatever. And, and i, I got to admit, I've been watching football for 40 years or more. I'm watching game last night. I had no opinion personally on it. And I'm saying it, it looks like they're doing everything in their power to let the Packers get the breaks here. I mean, listen, when you give a, a team a first down and the, other, the Lions don't have a timeout, and all you got to do is run into the line or take your knee and then kick a field. I mean, come on. Crosby is not going to miss a 20-something, 30-something yard field goal. It's terrible. It's bad. And, you, Jim, I think you hit on the head. What can you do about it? I mean, what can you do? It, it, it's a mess right now. And it seems like we get into these discussions just about every year at this time. I mean, I think back to when we had the replacement rest years ago and you had that infamous call in the end zone with Seattle. And, uh, and Green Bay, and, you know, the officials stood around each other, and then all of a sudden 
signal a touchdown or whatever, and yeah. two days later, the regular NFL officials were back on the job because the league couldn't take such a public relations hit. But these are their regular officials. But you know what? Something, I don't know what happened in the offseason, but if you've noticed, and I'm sure you have, a lot of the older referees, and not old men, but older they were in the league, and you saw them on, on our TV screens every week making you know the penalty calls, a lot of those guys are gone. Now, Three or four of them have gone to TV booths like Gene Steratore and, and Harry, who I just mentioned, and, and McCauley, who's with NBC. Something happened there in the league. I don't know what it is. I'm not a conspiracy, uh, conspiracy person. But if you look around, I, I could have counted up wrong, but I think there's only about six out of the 17 or 18 refs that are in the league last year that are still in the NFL. What is it? I mean, did everyone retire at once? I don't know. But the league probably wasn't so thrilled with some of the officiating and, you know, changed their crews, got rid of a lot of the refs and whatever. And now it's probably worse than it was last year. So I don't know what they're going to do. But when you've got hands to the face penalty called twice, at least twice, on a Lions last night, and both times the replay from up close to show you the guy's got his hand on the shoulder pads, there's a problem. I mean, you know, the, the officiating is just, it's bottom of the barrel right now. Yeah, it is. And, Maybe those officials that you were talking about, maybe they aged out. Um, you know, maybe they, had a, they made a decision that some, or they graded them and said they weren't worthy of being there anymore. But right now, it's pretty bad. You know, moving on to the following week, uh, we got some great matchups. We got a Thursday night game. We got a division game between Kansas City and Denver. Kansas City has um, hit some hard times. Their defense can't stop anybody. Denver probably got. You know, some bad breaks on, on two of their four losses. They could have been two and two at that point. Now they're playing a little bit better, and they've won a couple. And um, now they're a home dog to Kansas City. you got a couple of those uh, division games this week. You get, we don't know what's happened with Dallas. They win their first three against some real bad competition. And then they run up to, to some decent competition and uh, lose two. And then they run into the Jets. And all of a sudden, the kid comes back from mono and lights it up. And I don't know what Jerry's doing down in Jerry's world with that. But there's a lot going on in the NFL. And I, one question I have is, who's good? No, you're right. Uh, right now, I mean, you talked about the Chiefs first. I mean, they're really leaking oil right now. They got Tyree Chill back, the receiver, uh, puck returner. And he made that spectacular play the other day. Uh, for a touchdown, but the Chiefs are, they're struggling a bit, and you're right, the Broncos are a different team. I mean, they really got every bad break a team could get and went 0 and 4 to start, and, and their poor coach, Vic Fangio, looked like he was going to cry at the end of a couple of those where field goals beat him. Uh, but the Broncos are starting to gather momentum. Looks like they get a little more comfortable with Flacco as their quarterback. The balancing up their offense a little more, they, they could be a more than a pesky team for the rest of the season, and obviously two and four, you're not out of the playoff hunt, not in the NFL. Whereas the Chiefs, you know, you wonder how much Mahomes' ankle is bothering them, and you said it, their defense, it's not good. I mean, they brought Spagnola in there and got rid of Sutton because they figured they thought they should be a little more aggressive, a little more turnover minded. But you know what? They're not getting they're not getting a lot of pass rush pressure at times, and their secondary has always been a little on the leaky side. So. They've got some issues, and like you said with the Cowboys, I watched most of that game against the Jets the other day. I mean, the Jets looked like a, they took a 360-degree turn. Uh, you know, Donald coming back certainly looked looked uh, much better than what the Jets had in their quarterback. But the Cowboys, I don't know, they seem to step slow here and there. Uh, they seem to, I don't know, to me at times they've kind of forgotten about Zeke Elliott. You know, he'll go a quarter or so and maybe get two touches. It, it, it can't happen. I mean, even if they're down two scores, to me, you got this guy. He's definitely one of the top three or four running backs in the league. you got to feed him 25, 26 times a game. He's got to get the ball when he plays and, and stick to it. So the Cowboys have certainly hit, hit a rut, as you said. This, the season starting schedule, as it turned out, you know, they were playing some bad teams. The Giants before Daniel Jones. The Dolphins are obviously a bad team, so they've got to be doing some internal questions. And now they get they get uh, the Eagles in there, and you got the Eagles coach, you know, saying 
guaranteed or didn't guarantee to win. I don't, I don't care all about that kind of talk. But the Eagles are a desperate team. I mean, they did not look good in Minnesota the other day. Uh, they've got more talent than what they're showing. I know they've got injuries. There's no doubt the Eagles have hit. But you know what? You could say that about a dozen teams in the NFL where, you know, they're six, seven starters shy because of injuries. So the Eagles have to buck up. And the Cowboys, I don't want to say it's a must-win game, but, you know, football 101, ever since uh, they had divisions in this league, you better win your home divisional games if you want to make anything of your season. Otherwise, the Cowboys, I think, are going to wind up finding themselves battling and scrapping it out for a wild-card spot the last couple weeks of the season. And let's face it, I mean, that's always a long road to hope if you finish like the sixth seed or something. But the Cowboys, who started 3-0, they look like they've got a lot of lot of issues, and uh, I, I'm sure there's more than a few people feeling, you know, but you hear this all the time, that Jason Garrett should go and all this stuff. I don't know. I don't know what they, to me, if I'm the offensive coordinator, get the ball to Elliott 25 times a game. I don't care if you're down 21 nothing at the end of the first quarter. Play that way, bring the game back to yourself, and give yourself a shot. It. You know, who's the star in this offense? Elliot or Prescott? We know the answer. So Elliot has to have the ball more. And the Cowboys, you know, right now they're not playing with a whole lot of confidence either. They had that little rally against the Jets. But I, I, like I said, I watched the majority of that game. The Cowboys were not the Cowboys of the first couple of weeks of the season. You know, if they lose this game, it's a division loss. And it's be four straight losses for Dallas. It's a major game. But Philadelphia's dangerous. I don't know about that guaranteeing stuff, but you know, right? You know, I asked you a question. Who's and it was kind of like just a funny. Uh, who's good? Well, the Saints are good. Uh, they're, they're with Bridgewater. They've won every game he's started. They're five and one on the season. We still have Drew Brees rehabbing. He's going to come back eventually. They play at Chicago. who are coming off off the. Uh, the bye week and the, the London fiasco against the Raiders, um, that is one hell of a game. That's the game that I really want to watch. because, uh, And then the game right above it on the card, you got Mr. MVP. They're talk, everybody's talking about Russell Wilson. I'm a big Russell Wilson fan. I have been since he was in college. Uh, he's an amazing athlete, does a lot that uh, nobody even notices. I mean, he, the team isn't all that good. It's good, but it's not great. But they're five and one on the season. I don't know what they'd be if they didn't have a Russell Wilson. If they had just had a normal quarterback, this guy's a magician. Yeah, he's amazing. And when you think about it, I mean, they don't put so many design runs in him anymore. If you notice, I mean, he, he'll run when he has to. He'll tuck it under it. He'll get a first down on third and seven. Right? He looks. Downfield, nobody's open. He tucks it and runs and gets the first down more time than not. But uh, I tell you what, he's going to be hurt because his tight end now is out. The guy was basically a no name, Will Disley. But if you watch all the games and the highlights, you know, up to this point, you saw this guy catching a touchdown every game, it seems like. He's out, and that's going to take one uh, weapon away, which is going to hurt because he likes to go, you know, he likes to throw to his tall tight ends over the years. You know, we saw it back in the Jimmy Graham days. Uh, but Seattle, boy, they're, they're, they're good. I mean, spread-wise, it's funny. They've alternated point spread wins and losses. They started off not covering that Cincinnati game, and then it's been win, loss, win, loss, win. So from a spread standpoint, they haven't knocked anybody's socks off. But as you said, I mean, they're, they're finding ways to win these close games, right? They beat the Browns on the road by four. They, they won the one-point game over uh, the Rams. Uh, they had a two-point win at Pittsburgh back in week two. That's a sign of a good team, a confident team. You know, not to say you want to get into barn burners all the time, but Russell Wilson will get you to that finish line more times than not. And, uh, you know, little by little, they retool that defense. They really only have a couple of guys back from those Super Bowl teams. Bobby Wagner is obviously a star linebacker, but they retool the whole secondary, the defensive front. Obviously, they made some changes. They brought... Clowney in there, and uh, I'll tell you what, I, you and I talked in the summer, I thought Seattle would be decent, you liked them more than I did, I have to admit, I thought maybe they're a 10-win team if they could get a split with the Rams, well, you know what, they're looking more and more like they're going to be a guaranteed double-digit win team, and uh, they've got Baltimore coming in here, it's going to be very interesting to see how they try to bottle up 
Lamar Jackson. I mean, Pete Carroll is usually pretty good at that. You know, if he gets a quarterback that he's going up against that is a little bit like his own Russell Wilson, he's able to kind of funnel this guy into different areas that uh, I, I think they'll be pretty effective against them. And, uh, you know, Seattle has certainly been solid. And, you know, you talk about the Saints. It's funny, I was writing it today that uh, if you look at it, there's two teams in the same division here, the Saints and uh, and the Carolina Panthers, two teams that lost their quarterback early in the season, week, week two really, and since then they've been un- unstoppable. I mean, the Panthers with Kyle Allen, I mean, this guy has not thrown an interception in 122 pass attempts this year. He, he's wowed folks in a couple of games, had a four-touchdown game already this year, so, I mean, you got Teddy Bridgewater in New Orleans, who's been more than a manager or a game manager or more than a caretaker. And you've got Kyle Allen, who really lost his college job years ago to Kyle Murray way back way, five, six years ago at Texas A&M. So you've got the Saints and the Panthers, who both went without and have gone without Breeze and Newton, respectively. They haven't missed a beat. I mean, they've been solid. They've been point spread, uh, you know, great Great bets on on that side too, and uh, it, it's just funny how it's turned out. You know, Carolina's four and zero since week three against the number. Uh, New Orleans, we know they just come off the Jacksonville win, and that was a physical, hard fought game where they didn't get a whole lot of uh, from their running back Kamara, and they are four and zero straight up and against the spread since uh, Breeze went down. So interesting football. I mean, it goes to show you, Jim, what we talked about in the summer. If you have a backup quarterback, you can trust. You can, uh, you know, tread water. Well, you know what? These quarterbacks have done more than that. I mean, I think the Saints and Panthers would have signed for two and two in these four games after their QBs went down. Instead, they're roaring off the four and zero stretches. And uh, Saints against the Bears is going to be a very interesting game on Sunday. I think the Bears are very annoyed with how things went out in London. Like you said, that as all London team games are, the, the teams have a bye the next week. The Bears are going to be foaming at the mouth to start this game. So this is going to be a big test. Uh, it's almost a house money game, though, in my mind, for the Saints, because I don't think it's a game they should expect to win. I always think it's very hard for NFL teams to win back-to-back road games. So, anyway, we're going to see. But there's a, there's a couple of really nice matchups that we just touched on for here for Week 7. Uh, we got Ravens-Seahawks, great game. We got Saints at Bears, great game. And obviously the prime timer on Sunday night. Cowboys, Eagles, that should be a lot of fun. Well, that's a game, uh, I just noticed some line movement on this. Detroit was a two-point favorite. Uh, that was a line that was put up prior to the Minnesota, prior to the Monday night game. And uh, this morning, there was a, that it opened at two, Detroit two. But now, Minnesota's now gone to a one-point favorite at Detroit. That's an interesting line move. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, there was... I don't see any big injuries, but coming off the short week in Minnesota looked hot. The last couple of weeks, uh, <laughs> Kirk Cousins has played pretty well. Oh, he, he has. I mean, I'm not. I'm like a lot of people out there. I'm not a big Kirk Cousins fan, but uh, he was he was pinpoint. I mean, he threw some beautiful deep balls to uh, Stephon Diggs and won the touchdown to Thielen. He looked good. I mean, he looked like the guy who is earning you know that monster salary that he's getting. And let's face it, the Vikings have talent. I mean, they, they've got playmakers. They've got a running back who not a lot of people talk about, but Dalvin Cook's probably, you know, he's in the top six, seven running backs in this league, maybe higher. And that defense has athletes. I mean, uh, they drafted uh, defensive backs many years in a row. I mean, I, I think it's five or six years in a row where they picked either a quarterback or a safety. So that secondary has boned up over time. They still have a pass rush. They've got an active linebacker, that kid Barr, who really signed with the Jets and then kind of renamed. I mean, he, he seemingly makes one big turnover type play every game. The Vikings are for real. I mean, they, but they should, you know, I, I mean, I want to see one year where they put it together. We saw it two years ago. They got to the uh, championship game. They played in Philly and they just laid a complete egg coming off that. Wilds win against the Saints in the in the previous round of the divisional round. I want to see the Vikings put it together one year. They they seem like a team that just can't totally get over the hump. I mean, we know from talking and, and researching over the years, they've been a tremendous point spread team for Mike Zimmer. I mean, they 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 knock them out at sixty five, sixty six percent, and uh, 
they they got it all. They they have it all. And if Cousins plays like this or anything close to this, you know what? If you look around this NFC, there's no reason they can't be playing in the you know NFC Championship game. No, uh, no. In January they really yeah. could. You know they they they're in a real tough division: Detroit, Chicago, Green Bay, and Minnesota. That's that is a tough division. You look at some other divisions; they got absolutely nobody. This division is loaded with quality clubs. Not all of them can make it to the playoffs. We know that. And Minnesota, of those four teams, I feel Minnesota has the best roster. Uh, I would say it might be Chicago, but without a quarterback that's really a quality, I can't say that for them. Um, it, but I, I think Minnesota is the most dangerous of the four. But it's really close, and you could it's it's it. That is a tough, tough division. All four of those teams are quality clubs. There's one other game. It's interesting. Houston just went up to Kansas City, and they beat Kansas City, and that was uh, I think third straight loss or second straight loss for Kansas City at home. And now they go to Indianapolis. And um, originally Houston came in here; they were one point favorite. Now they're pick 'em or one point dog. Really doesn't matter there. It's a, it's not much of a number. But Indianapolis also went up to Kansas City and beat them. And, uh, you know, this is a team, the Colt team, that lost Andrew Luck, and they're doing a lot with the Jacoby Brissett. No, they, they are. They've, uh, you know, they were a team that I think everyone thought that was going to be a, a, a gut punch, you know, when, when Luck retired, which was very late in the summer, if people remember. It was the, the late days in... In August, maybe a week before uh, uh, the cuts were going to be made and whatnot, but the Colts have really hung tough. I mean, they probably deserve better in that week one game against the Chargers. They lost by six in overtime, but outside of that, I mean, they've really played solid. Uh, they did lose a home game to the Raiders, which is a game that at the end of the year they may they may really regret because it may cost them a playoff spot or something. But you're right, Jim. They've played well. They're uh, they play very solid. We know their offensive line is, I mean, that was the irony to the whole thing with Luck. This is his best offensive line, the best O-line that the Colts have had probably in eight to ten years. And, now, and he retires. I'm not blaming him, and I don't want to bring up the whole Luck thing again. But, I mean, for so many of his years, at least five of his years there, their offensive line was bottom of the barrel, oh. and he was taking a beating. Now they've got a quality offensive line. I mean, they've got what everyone considers is the best guard in the league at Nelson. They've got a center from Alabama. If he stays healthy, Kelly is a great center. Their left side of the line is just tremendous, and uh, they're a solid team. I mean, they, you know, they, they seem to play to the level of competition. I don't know if it's me, but, I mean, I'm looking. They went overtime week one. They beat Tennessee by two, beat Atlanta by three, Lost by a touchdown, and then one by six. So every game they play is a one-score game. I mean, we seem to have one or two of those teams in the league every year. It's like the cardiac kids. You know, they always get those the, the, those little uh, nicknames on them. But the Colts seem to play that way. It seems like when I'm watching these games and they're showing the scores or up cutting over to the red zone channel, I'm like, oh, my God, the Colts are in a really game that's, you know, a one-score or a tie game with two minutes to go. So if they can win their share of them, I think we're going to see them in January. But, uh, you know, Brissett's been, obviously, he, he really hasn't killed them. He's had a couple of big tosses that I've seen. But overall, they can't ask for much for. And it's funny, I'm saying that every game they play is close. I'm looking at their point differential. They scored 113. They've given up 115. They're minus two. I mean, that's the cult of this year. Every, every game is, is a one-score, last-possession type of game. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Joe, uh, what do you have going to Jim Hurley this week? Well, we're going to have a big NFL week, as you said. I mean, I... We talked about all these penalty flags, all the officiating stuff. Listen, I'm not saying it's all going to get cleaned up overnight, but if the league wants to do themselves a favor, they'll get it cleaned up because this is going to really be a big week. It's going to be a big week for Jim Harley Network. You touch on it. Thursday night's game right out of the gate is a, is a great game. Chiefs, Broncos with the Broncos, you know, they're trending up these days. We're going to have decided totals there. Uh, let me give out the phone number. It's toll free one eight hundred three two three four four five three. Again, it's a toll free number. We've been around since nineteen eighty five. 
solid season after solid season. 1-800-323-4453. As we said, Chiefs Broncos gets it all started in the pros on Thursday. We mentioned all the great Sunday games, including the Sunday night, Philly-Dallas. And uh, the college season has been pretty good to us so far. So we're going to keep rolling along with the colleges. We've had our fair share of wins with some, you know, uh, non-Power 5 type of games. We had South Florida with a big win against BYU the other day. We're going to keep cranking it out on the college side, too. So don't forget, it's 1-800-323-4453. That's the Jim Hurley Network. You can also get us online, Jim Hurley. That's H-U-R-L-E-Y dot com. Game days, we've got it all Saturday morning, Sunday morning. Check with us after 10 a.m. Get you all the winners, and uh, you will not be disappointed. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. Great uh, podcast. We'll talk again soon. Okay, Jim. Enjoy the sports. Thanks, buddy.